Um, I'm going to go back and I'll start with Bonnie. Um, which local resources would you point someone to if they're in need following an incident and what steps would they need uh, to take to, to become completely independent? Um, oh, I need this. Um, or I could use my mom voice. <laughs> Um, it, w it would really depend on what the incident was. And if a woman contacted myself or, or agency or organization, um, we would find out what the problem was. We'd find out, we'd want to make sure that she's not in any danger, um, if she would want to call 911, if she was in danger, or to have the police come to her home. Um, the, one of the problems is that when survivors or, or women have these experiences or go through these incidents they don't know where to call they haven't got a clue and I've worked with many survivors who have said that that finally they found a shelter or finally they found a counseling service but most times they don't in most women in the community do not know where to call or who to contact and that's the importance of everybody in the community learning more about this so that when they do have a neighbor or a friend or a relative who says, this has been my experience, that first of all, you just listen. And, and then you can say, well, you know, did you know that these things are available? And if you would like, as it had been said before, not pushing them into anything, but allowing them to choose when and where and how that they are, are going to um, do that. And the second part of your question is, um, what steps would they need to take to become independent? That's a huge question. Um, because for many women, it's, it's so many different things. Like, you know, um, whether they're financially stable, whether they um, need counseling, whether um, they need housing, that's the big, one of the biggest issues is that most women need housing. Um, so to become independent, it's, uh, again, it depends on the circumstances and the woman herself. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, this uh, question is for Luke. Uh, as a male, what would you say are your responsibilities in ensuring that this uh, movement and conversation continues and touches all aspects of social life? Yeah. Um, I, I think about it personally first, and uh, for me, uh, persistence and continuing the dialogue and expressing to my male friends this is an important issue. This is something that I am okay to talk about and I am okay to learn and grow uh, as an individual and, and kind of be a conduit for that kind of thinking. Um, as well, uh, I think it's important to be an active bystander. Mm -hmm. I think it's okay to tell your friends and your family members their type of language or their comments or their jokes are, are not okay and, and here's why. Um, when I think collectively, uh, I really think that men have not truly embraced the ubiquitous nature of sexual harassment and sexual violence towards women. I don't think that's been done yet. And, and I would like to see that happen because the, the next step is what do we do about it? And so those are, those are kind of the things that uh, I would like to see and that I'm actively pushing for. Awesome, thank you so much. Uh, this is for uh, Sidra. The, the movement was uh, initially centered on women of color, as you mentioned. It now appears to be more centered around Hollywood actresses and people of privilege. Uh, why is that case um, and are we still listening um, to all the voices? Um, yeah, I think the, you know, the main reason is racism, you know, um, you know, particularly anti-black racism. You know, Tarana Burke has done so much amazing work, and yeah, the fact that that kind of work isn't given the profile, it's because people don't value the lives of of black girls as much as they do Hollywood celebrities. It's really unfortunate, but I think it's important to name that. Um, yeah, are we still listening to all of the voices? I feel like voices that are given are really, it's a, it's a double-edged sword because it's always good to see these conversations hitting mainstream media and it's good to see the conversations happening. So I, sometimes I feel like, okay, whoever they'll listen to, like 
great because at least we're talking about this. At least we're seeing a perpetrator being held accountable. At least people are, you know, sharing their stories and getting this message out there. Um, but it, so it's a double-edged sword. On the one hand, okay, if it takes Hollywood celebrities to get break the conversation through, then so be it. But then at what cost, right? And does their victory trickle down to everybody else? You know, if a Hollywood actress is believed when she talks about sexual violence and she's able to afford to, um, you know, risk being sued for defamation, that's a huge one. So many survivors don't speak out, you know, because a lot of how Me Too happened was through uh, stories in the, uh, in the news, right? So it wasn't even necessarily that the women went and press charges through the legal system, they just named names on social media and in the media. Mm -hmm. And to do that, you need to be able to afford the risk of being sued for defamation. Um, I, I have not named the perpetrator for that exact reason. I do not have the money to be sued for defamation. So do victories for people with that kind of money and that sort of privilege, you know, it's almost like setting an example that not everyone can follow. Um, so in terms of, you know, are we still listening to all the voices? I think we need to find more creative ways to give space, like Luke was mentioning, you know, create space for survivors to be able to share their stories in a way that they'll feel heard and they'll feel listened to mm -hmm. and in a way that's safe for them. You know, not asking them to do the same risk that a Hollywood actress could take, you know, but have other ways to be visible. Um, and, you know, kind of like the point I was trying to make in my talk, not even demand that people have to share their their story per se, but have other ways. Like one, one um, tip I really like is rather than asking someone to speak as a survivor, to, to have them speak as an expert on sexual violence. Because mm -hmm. after navigating all those systems, like absolutely survivors are experts. So just, yeah, that's one thing I, what, you know, avenue I can think of to help balance out the, the louder voices and, you know, people who are, who are marginalized. Um, Awesome, thank you. And I think, you know, a perfect example of um, giving women a voice, feeling a space where they're safe and heard, and not uh, making them uh, re victimize and, and reliving the trauma uh, in order for them to be believed and have that power and control. So, thank you so much for your your um, discussion and your pr presentation. I'd like to thank our incredible panelists tonight. Uh, I would like to ask you to give them a, a round of applause for <laughs> spending their evening with us. We now want to open up our conversations uh, to our amazing audience that is here with us tonight, as well as uh, those of you who are sharing with us online. Uh, it looks like that we have a lot of questions from our audience, and uh, if we can hear from our first one. So if you, if you do have a question, if you want to come down to the mic, you can come and ask it here, and we can just form a line. Um, or again, if you need, we can go around and collect post-its, and we do have some post-it notes from prior to the session with some questions as well. Maybe I will start with one of those. <laughs> Okay, so the first one is, how do we help more women and girls report? And feel free, any panelists, if you'd like to take this. Well, um, at Girls Inc., we provide curriculum programming and uh, a program for girls. We have um, informed in charge, which really leads the discussion all about power and control and consent. So sharing even scenarios and a lot of times um, sharing areas uh, to, for them to be able to, to practice those skills and tools in their toolbox sometimes then um, can, can lead uh, to, to showing and sharing what are some of those avenues, places to go for help and support, places to go to 
um, share and being heard. And I think that's how the Me Too movement spiked all that was that, um, you know, somebody shared their story that rang true and all of a sudden it was, I see um, a sisterhood, an al a collection of, of allies uh, in a shared space where I feel safe that I can um, feel that I can share and move forward. So I think it's important to have these spaces uh, for us to be able to share that. And I think it's also um, to be advocates and change agents where wherever we are. And so having specific curriculum that's designed uh, as young as six that goes all the way up uh, until 18 they practice those tools in order to look at when you say um, somebody should um, they practice on oh this is what I'm I'm doing whether I'm going to talk to my family my community my church my my group my gathering and so that's the that pebble in the um, in the lake that does that ripple effect Hello? Yeah, so um, I don't know. My perspective and from what I've seen and other survivors I've talked to, I think it's, I don't know if getting more people to report is a fair goal uh, because the justice system right now isn't really safe for a lot of uh, survivors. You know, if, um, if someone reports and then there are criminal charges and it goes to trial, like just really understanding what, like I think if you're uh, supporting someone in making the decision whether she wants to report or not, help it be an informed decision so that she knows what the risks and benefits are for both, for all the paths that she has to choose from, not to go in, you know, assuming that things are going to be one way and then finding out later, you know, having to be on a witness stand and cross-examined you know, these are all things that I think people should be aware of before uh, being told, oh, why, you know, just go report it. Like, help people have an informed decision about the risks and benefits of the different paths, so. I'll ask another one. Um, so the hashtag Me Too movement has existed for a couple of years. So how has it been affected after going viral in recent months? For example, mainstream media, misconceptions, diluting the intent of the movement, and so forth. So how has it affected the intent of the movement after going viral in the last recent months? So uh, misconceptions or diluting the intent of the movement. Uh, I'd like to say a couple things about that. I, I have listened to some of the criticisms of Me Too and um, I, I would certainly say that I think the criticism such as um, it creates a, a, a witch hunt against men are, are ill-informed about the entirety of the intent of the, the issue, which is to bring to the forefront how, um, like I said before, how ubiquitous this issue really is. Um, this is not um, an issue that's just set up to shame men. And I think that's one of the main defenses that, that uh, some men bring to the table saying like, well, you know, it, it's just to, to uh, shame men and uh, it's to target these people and these uh, uh, women are coming forward at uh, times that then can destroy the man's career. And, and I think about that and I think this woman has been living with this uh, memory each and every day. And I think about the, the Kavanaugh situation and, and I know that that woman is a, is a doctor and she's a, she's a professor, and I think that she probably drew a line in the sand. I cannot stand silent for one more second while this man gets even more power without people knowing what he did. And so I, I think that was a very brave step. But just getting back to the question, you see a lot of people trying to criticize this issue, um, and it just needs to be overstated what the actual intent of Me Too is. And it can evolve, and it should. So, yeah, I just want to say some of those things. And highlighting that it's, it's, uh, it's not all men. It's not a men versus women. And there are so many amazing men who are champions and are allies uh, in the movement as well. And I think um, we have a, 
a great example right here on the stage. And I think it's really important also um, that when you see the backlash and the victimization or re-victimization a lot of times by things that are posted um, and you hear for example, in the Kavanaugh case where she had to had death threats and had to go to the FBI, that that can then also be um, a real strong signal to silence a lot of people. So I think that while it does do the forefront that we're having this discussion today and many people are engaged, um, it also does highlight the need to do more work. speak specifically to um, using social media and how people employ social media to engage themselves. And on platforms such as Instagram or Twitter or sometimes even Facebook, there's a certain element of anonymity that can be employed. So people might feel a little bit more comfortable using a hashtag under an anonymous profile. So maybe they can build those relationships, build those conversations so that those that discourse is happening, whereas they might not be comfortable having that face to face. So there is an online community. There are loads of online communities on Twitter, on Instagram, on Facebook, and these kinds of social media communities aren't fake. They're real, and they're real people. It's just that sometimes people don't share their personal names. So sometimes taking that first step can happen on social media, and then um, what happens after that is the decision of whomever is involved. Okay, we're going to take one from the online. <laughs> Uh, we've received a couple of really good questions um, online. The first one comes from Twitter. How do we support survivors who don't want to be public, particularly if we're forced to interact with the alleged abuser? Um, <clears throat> it's hard to answer without knowing the specifics of how um, the person has to interact with the abuser, but um, I've spoken to a lot of different people in different versions of that situation. Um, yeah, I mean, in my case, I removed myself from spaces where uh, the person was present. Uh, but I think, you know, some of the things that I've heard that people do that work are have allies in the space as well. So if you can find anyone who you trust who's also in the same space or who's nearby or you or you can check in with, you know, over your phone, through texting, just have some other people aware, like, okay, I'm going to be at work from two to six today and I have a meeting and the person will be there, right? So just not being alone with it, having a community of people, like you, because you were saying, you know, if the person doesn't want to be public, have a network, even if it's people that you just know online, you know, find some safe people for yourself that you can check in with before and after the interactions happen. Um, you know, make sure to constantly remind yourself that it's not your fault. If it's an ongoing situation, I, I don't know, for some reason I'm assuming this is something in a workplace, to document everything um, where you can uh, in case eventually you do want to come forward or build a case. Uh, and I guess just on a personal note, I don't know if this is like official advice that, that one would give, but uh, to put yourself first and to realize that your safety matters and, you know, kind of to go any lengths to allow yourself to be safe. So don't ever feel like you have to be in a place where your abuser is if you don't want to be. Like give yourself permission to leave um, if it comes down to that. Our next question comes from Facebook. How do you think that this recent Me Too conversation and activism, ac advocacy, et cetera, will affect policy and political change? It has raised a lot of questions in and around um, what we've seen uh, around understanding uh, consent, understanding um, uh, 
you know, health and sexuality and also healthy relationships. Um, so the um, Ontario government that is going to have opportunities for uh, people to talk about some of the curriculum and, and the repeal of the curriculum, but implementing new curriculum, I encourage uh, everybody uh, to utilize their voice and input in uh, looking at what uh, types of information that we want to be able Able to have for our youth and 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 our children it, it, that's age appropriate as they move along so that you know we don't have to see documentaries um, like hunting ground or uh, mis representation where we are sending um, you know our, our students uh, out to post-secondary education without the skills and tools uh, for them to equip to navigate this and having those dialogues so um, that's one great opportunity for us to use our voice in in a form of action that's that it probably already has changed and I think social and cultural and political change takes a really long time a really long time so when we change our everyday behavior and I think all of us have talked about that to a certain extent that we are agents of change whether it's in our own home and with our friends and with our family these things happen first and then that creates the revolution and you know we, we see how long it takes for political change for policy to change it it takes longer than it really could or should and the the biggest difference is how we as people behave on the daily I think is, is where we really need to focus. When we start thinking about the big picture too much, we get overwhelmed and it's like, oh my gosh, you know, this is never going to change. So if we take it upon ourselves to engage ourselves um, with those around us, that I think is the biggest, um, the biggest push. I'm just gonna repeat the question so that we do capture it. So uh, the audience member is looking for information on where more events of this nature are taking place or where they can find more information or follow um, to get more information. So the Violence Prevention Coordinating Council um, website has a calendar of different events that are taking place throughout the community from all different resources and all different organizations and agencies. is uh, Girls' Rights Week and uh, highlighting um, Girls Inc. has a, a Bill of Rights and looking at uh, community action programs that are available and we have open forums the first week in, in May for the community for that involvement and it allows to demonstrate for young girls to, ha to see how they're change agents in their communities and connect them with things that are happening in their communities as well so uh, having uh, community leaders and and uh, advocates and champions as yourself in the community engaged in that as well. We've got one more question. How do we teach our children allyship at, at an early age? How do you teach an adult to be an ally? Well, uh, Girls Inc. actually has a program called Allies in Action, and it's being able to identify uh, uh, as young as uh, six years of age who your allies are. So you have your circle of influence, and you use just common language like um, the people in my inner circle that um, 
make me feel safe, respected, and heard. Um, and then you can have a outer circle that are maybe people that are in your close proximity that you come into contact with that don't do not have that effect. Um, so looking at who you have in that inner circle and slowly building that so that when there are times uh, when you are overcoming and, and coming into difficulty that you can um, access your inner circle. So there are certain terms that we we have seen with the increase of social media and um, the numbers of likes and sort of friends that you have. Um, the term that um, has been used is friend Enemy, so people who don't have your best interest in at heart, but you feel are in your inner circle, um, you can identify that they don't have that effect uh, on making you feel uh, safe, respected, heard, believed. Um, so you may want to move them out into your outer circle and then uh, build upon that. So there are many activities that we can do um, as a society. and have the conversation with your children to be able to say who do you identify as a positive influence in your life in your inner circle and help them expand on that as as they grow um my name is leslie um and as a survivor of domestic violence i first wanted to thank you all for the conversation that you had here today and on to my question. Um, I'm in the process of launching a podcast platform for individuals to speak about their trauma and healing journey. I found that me sharing my own story gave me power and I wanted to give that power to other women and individuals that have experienced trauma in general. And so I just wanted to know um, what are some more ways that I can facilitate and support survivors that do come and share their stories with me? And then also, what are some services in Durham that I can collaborate with when I do start holding safe space events in the community? Anybody can answer. <laughs> Pardon? Your podcast? Yes. Okay. Yeah. So for there's a really good guide called Use the Right Words by Femifesto. And in that guide, it has tips for interviewing survivors of sexual violence. It's kind of for um, people working in the media. So the idea behind those tips is to give, you know, again, that sense of control um, to the person you're interviewing. So you'll see the full guide, but among the tips are, you know, for example, providing all the interview questions well in advance so that they can prepare, there's no surprises, and, say, and they can say, you know what, I don't wanna answer that. They can come with notes, you know, pre-typed, you know, this idea that you just have to put someone on the spot and surprise them with questions, like no need to do that at all. Um, ask them how they want to identify themselves. Maybe they don't want to identify as a survivor again. They might want to be an expert on a particular, you know, area that's related to their experience, but they can just share about that area as an expert without having to get into all the details of their story. You know, for example, you know, how are Indigenous women affected by, you know, housing when it comes to domestic violence? So there might have been someone who had that experience, but they can just share about the policies or the issues, the change they want to see happen rather than having to retell their story. So that can be an empowering way to frame it for people. Um, also, um, encouraging to, them to bring a support person with them, you know, like have someone with you. You know, there's no need to, again, this idea, you know, come alone, surprise questions, like no need for any of that. Uh, yeah, they can have a support person. You can, um, you know, chat with them beforehand, afterwards, um, have, re you know, it's always kind of awkward to be like, here's a helpline if you need it. Like, but you know, they, you know, have the support person, but also have resources for them as well. And um, I, I guess podcasts, forgive me, I'm not so savvy. They're recorded, right? It's not live. So oh, um, I have a website that goes along with it so that yeah. people that are actually listening, if they feel triggered at any moment by the episode, they yeah. can go on the website and there are different exercises and activities or resources that they can That's look great. into and do stuff like that. Yeah. Okay. So if it's recorded, you can say, you know what, and you can listen to the recording before we launch it. If you say, you know what, I really regret saying that, take it out. Yeah. Give them that control too. So, okay. yeah. Cool. Thank you. Um, 
if it is recorded, uh, you can go to them. So um, go to where they yeah. feel is a safe place for them to be able to. And uh, you may want to also look at uh, intergenerational and cross-cultural. So mm -hmm. it's really interesting. Um, you know, I've uh, come across um, with amazing women in their late 80s who are yeah. um, disclosing uh, certain situations that are happening that they've kept silent for for generations. Yeah. So to say um, the podcast is the way to go. Uh, I think that's awesome. Uh, that makes me very proud. Uh, I certainly want to uh, post your podcast on all of our social media. And, and in fact, I want to be on your podcast. I so, was going to ask if, yeah, if anybody would that's like awesome. to. Awesome. Thank you so much. Resources. Again, if you go to vpccdurham.org, um, all of 32 agencies are there with links to their websites. Perfect. Thank you so much. So um, another question, so how, so advice, so how do you deal with the issue when it resulted in a child and every day you see that child, so how do you deal with that? So yeah, so sexual violence, so how do you deal with the issue of sexual violence when it has resulted in a child and then you are seeing that child every day, um, so how do you deal with that circumstance? Experienced the violence? Is that what that is the question? The product, the product of, of sexual violence, okay, yes. A really complicated issue, right? It's multi layered. It's not something that uh, I think would be appropriate to sort of try to gloss over, but um, uh, that person would, would certainly. Um, benefit from some services that they think are, are going to be helpful uh, as well as the child when uh, that time was appropriate um, and uh, yeah that would be something that I, th that I would hope that uh, community members and it would take a village you know mm -hmm. for that so um, but yeah that's uh, certainly something that I that I know has happened in our community is is uh, something that isn't uh, just something you'll see on, on some sort of exotic television show that is real life. And so um, that wouldn't be the only person experiencing that. I can certainly understand why that would be um, a very um, isolating experience to go through. And I would encourage that person to seek support and take care of themselves. We have one more from online, is that correct? Yes? Okay. And then we'll end it at that. Okay, great. The last question from Facebook is, what's being done to change the lack of housing for women in crisis? But we have, we, there is a, a national housing strategy now that's uh, been uh, released and one positive aspect of that is 25% of the uh, money is uh, allotted towards uh, women's housing. So that's promising, but uh, we'll need a lot of people to keep their eyes on that to see how it actually plays out and how the money is used in each province. But yeah, the National Housing Strategy, if you Google it, you could see the whole document and follow the different um, uh, individuals that are involved in that rollout in our province as well time you look at homelessness and, and, and housing is always an issue. There's never enough affordable housing and to be able to have the solution overnight has to be a real, um, I think we've been having this conversation, I know I, for, for over 40 years. And um, so as we look at new strategies, new opportunities, it's, it's not one level of government, uh, whether it's a federal, provincial, or municipal, it takes a community effort. And also looking at, um, you know, affordable housing strategies in our in our neighborhood as we have uh, new populations. And I have two adult children that boomeranged back, so <laughs> they're looking for housing too. Um, I would like to take this um, opportunity. Does anyone else have anything to say? For, no? 
to uh, our final remarks. I'd like to thank all of you that were able to attend tonight, whether you uh, attended in person or online. I'd like to give a big thank you to our brilliant speakers that are here with us this evening. And thank you to the Town of Ajax uh, staff, your volunteers, our community partners, and to you, our Ajax residents that had come here out tonight. Uh, you have created a night of engagement, of incredible conversation, and I invite you to take this opportunity to mingle, to network, and meet some of our presenters out in the front lobby. We have some booths and resources that are set up uh, that are outside from you, from Girls Inc., Horizon House, VPCC, OCASI, and Durham Regional Police Services as well. So I'd like to keep the conversation going. So please uh, save the date for our next In Conversation with uh, speaker seri series, which will be held on Friday, November the 23rd. Uh, thank you all for coming tonight and enjoy the rest of your evening and please drive safely. Thank you so much.